morning, friends, and welcome to our online service this morning from Trinent Parish Church. I warmly welcome you to in your homes this morning, and I, I hope you have a blessed day. I'm Malcolm Muir. I was looking here at Trinent, and I've been asked to lead the worship this morning. And a very warm welcome once again to you all, and it's lovely to be back with you. Our call to worship this morning, friends, is based on Psalm 34, the first two verses, and then from verse 17 to 22. So the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Lord says, I will bless the Lord at all times. God praise shall continually be in my mouth. Our souls make their boast in the Lord, and let the humble here be glad. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears them and rescues them for all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who are brokenhearted. Our God saves those who are crushed in spirit. Praise be to God now and forever and ever. Amen. So our first hymn is All Creatures of Our God and King.
Let us pray. Father, as we gather this morning, God of our days and our nights, Lord of our valleys and our mountain tops, we come from the sanctuary to into the homes of the, the folk around the internet, and especially those of Tonight Parish Church. We come into your presence for this time of worship to worship you and to give you the praise that you deserve and to show you that the love that we have for you because of your goodness. We come to learn from you what you would have us do and be. So Father, grant us this day and may it be a time of prayer, a time of communion in our homes and a praiseful thought and meditation. And grant too that we may rejoice no matter what the circumstances are this morning in our lives and to develop a stronger faith in you. For Father, we ask these in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us when we pray to say together, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as it is on earth, as it is in heaven. So give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And so our next hymn, friends, it's me, it's me, it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. We just have one reading this morning, and it's from Luke chapter 18, and from verse 9 to 14, which follows the reading from last week, when very much Jesus was the parable of the judge and, and, and the widow. So we're now here of the Pharisee and the tax collector, and I'm delighted that Laurie will read for us this morning. Good morning. Our reading is taken from... Luke chapter 18 at verse 9, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. 
For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. Amen. May God add his blessing to this reading. And so as we go into our sermon this morning, we sing together hymn 555, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound.
friends, let's pray. God of our days and God of our nights, of our comings and our goings, bless, we pray, the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts. And by them, the power of your Holy Spirit, Father, make us more fitting servants of your most holy will. For we ask it in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, this morning, we have heard Laurie read for us from Luke's Gospel. Someone once said, there are two kinds of folk in this world. There are those who wake up in the morning and say, good morning, Lord. And there are the others who wake up and say, good Lord, it's morning. And to be honest, I have to say that I am definitely that latter kind of person now that I have retired. There are only two people in two kinds of folk in this world. We hear this saying quite often. Woody Allen gives his two cents by saying, there are two types of people in this world, the good and the bad. The good sleep better and the bad seem to enjoy the waking hours much more. And so the gospel of Luke this morning is continuing to ask and answer the question, who is in the kingdom of God? Or to put the question another way, who can be justified before God? For in this parable, Jesus is going to show who is justified before God and how such one is justified. The parable is going to show two people trying two different means to find justification. So the parable begins, before it begins, Luke tells us that Jesus told this parable to people who trusted in themselves for righteousness and treated others with contempt. The problem is clearly stated. Jesus is dealing with people who are trusting in themselves for salvation and justification. In trusting in themselves, they are treating other people with contempt, a term that we frequently use that these people were self-righteousness. So this parable is going to describe them and their error so that they will understand how when one enters the kingdom of God. And so the, there are two extremes at play. For the parable begins with two men going up to the temple for prayer. There were two periods of public prayer each day, about 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. We don't think the prayer in these terms, but in what the Jewish people did back then in that first century. We see this prayer activity throughout the book of Acts. The two people go up in this prayer are two extremes in Jewish society. First, there is the Pharisee is one of the extremely religious folk of that day. We see them on many occasions when you have been looking at Luke. They were the folk who showed contempt and full disdain, of course, for others who were not like them. So the other person is this tax collector. And even to this day, the tax collector can be a dreaded word. The tax collector was a villain of his day. Consider how the, compla the complaint against Jesus was that he ate with sinners and, of course, tax collectors. Tax collectors were considered the worst of folk, usually being thieves, extortioners, and traitors of the Jewish nation. Tax collectors were hated by sinners. The two people are a contrast of extremes here. The Pharisee represents the moral righteous person and the tax collector represents the vile immoral person. So let's have a wee look at the Pharisee. Why does the Pharisee think that he is in the kingdom of God? How does he think justification occurs? He thinks he has justification quite simply because of all the things he is doing. He thinks he is good, he's a moral person. Look at all the things he is doing. 
He is not like those awful folk in the world. He's certainly not like this immoral, this vile tax collector. This is what the religious and secular world thinks about justification today, doesn't it? People think that they just need to go to church somewhere and they can find it to be justified, to be right in God's sight. Some think because they do charitable deeds, give their money to others. And some think just simply that they are generally good, fairly moral, and not as bad as those terrible, terrible people who are thieves and murderers. Most people, friends, justification is found in making a difference and leaving this world better than you found it. But there is a shocker in the story. According to verse 14, this person was not justified. The moral, upright person with all his religious acts is not justified. And how could this be? The problem is that he thinks he is righteous by what he does. The Pharisee had not listened to the prophets which declared the truth. In Psalm 51 it's declared, For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I will give it up. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. And then Isaiah, and Hosea, sorry. Hosea declared, What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud. Like the dew that goes early away. Therefore I have given the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And my judgment goes forth as the light. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. The knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And Isaiah. Isaiah spoke similarly. You come to help those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continued to sin against you, you were angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our, all our righteousness acts are like filthy rags. We are shriveled up like a leaf. And like the wind, our sins just sweep away. In Isaiah 64, verses 5 and 6. And so, friends, a story. As a man goes to heaven, and St. Peter meets him at the pearly gates, and he says, how, here's how it works. You need a hundred points to make it into heaven. You tell me the good things you have done, and I will give you a certain number of points for each of them. Then depending on how, how good it was, and when you reach 100 points, you're going to get in. Okay, the man says, I was married to the same woman for 50 years and never cheated on her, even in my heart. Oh, that's wonderful, Saint Peter says. I've given you three points. Three points? Well, I attended church all my life and supported its ministry and give regularly with my offerings and, self and service. Terrific, says Peter. Certainly worth a point. One point, golly, about this, I, of course, as well, started a soup kitchen in my town and worked in a shelter for homeless veterans. Fantastic. Again, says St. Peter, two more points. Two points, the man cries, upset by all this. At this rate, the only way I'm going to get into heaven is by the grace of God. Come in, says St. Peter. Come in. So we have the tax collector right at the other end of a spectrum. What made the tax collector different in this parable? Why would Jesus endorse as a moral tax collector as the one who is justified and entering the kingdom of God rather than the Pharisee? 
First, the humility of the tax collector pours out with every description. In verse 13, the tax collector will not even approach the temple. As he comes up to the temple for prayer, he will not draw near, but of course stands afar off. He recognizes his own unworthiness to approach God. He does not lift up his eyes. The lifting of the eyes were a normal posture in Jewish prayer. Yet this is another sign of humility that he will not even look up towards heaven. Further, he beats his chest, which was a sign of extreme sorrow and contrition. The beating of the chest was not normal for Jewish prayer. God honors the humble. God exalts the humble, as cross-referenced in James. God wants a humble and contrite heart, as in Psalm 51. The tax collector is showing a humble heart. Further, and importantly, he has a humble heart and understands he needs atonement and mercy. His words are about his actions. He does not give a list of good things that he has certainly done in his life. He does not speak about how he is better than certain folk. He does not say that he has a better heart than the lousy Pharisee. What is there to say before the Lord regarding our justification? Friends, it's certainly not, look at what I've done. For the tax collector, remember, understands that we do not want God to look at what we have done. When God looks at what we have done, we quickly utter the words, God be merciful to me, a sinner. We must quickly call out atonement for covering all our wrongdoings. We think that we can stand on our actions and stand on our righteousness is the pinnacle of arrogance and pride. Do we truly think that our actions can justify us before the Almighty God? For the tax collector understood. The tax collector understood his need for mercy and repentance. So how do good works fit into the picture this morning? So often people will discard good works as if they were not relevant. Our good works do not justify us. Our good works do not enter us into the kingdom of God. Jesus already explained the value of our good works earlier in the gospel. In Luke 17, at verse 10, So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Our good works are not meritorious. They are very much praiseworthy. Not because that is what we are supposed to do. No one very much would stop us, would they? Let's close with how we can very much at the heart of the tax collector and not the heart of the Pharisee. The tax collector, remember, had a long journey in front of him. But thank God. He's pointed in the right direction where the Pharisee is building up this his hard shell. Something breaks and the hard shell, of course, very much the tax collector sins and drags him into the light of God's mercy. And because he is bathed in the compassion of God, there is a good chance that he will look on other people with compassion. Yeah, the Pharisee is thankful that he is not like other folk. And because and becomes less and less connected with them. The tax collector starts out isolated from the other folk, but he hits the bottom and meets God with grace. There he rejoices that he is like others, 
Because God's mercy means mercy for all. And all who follow God must mean mercy for all. A mercy that transforms the undeserving and is greater than the powers of death. You know, friends, that religion can take us in either of two directions. But finally, only one of them leads us to God. In a justly famous passage, St. Isaac of Syria describes this path. He writes, a compassionate heart, he tells us, is a heart on fire for the whole of creation, for humanity, for the birds, for the animals, for the demons, and for all that exists. At the recollection and at the sight of them, such a person's eyes overflow with tears, owing to the venomous of the compassion which grips his heart. And as a result, his deep mercy, his heart shrinks and cannot bear to hear or to look on an injury of the slightest suffering of anything in creation. Father going on to say, this is why he constantly offers up prayers full of tears. Even the irrational animals and for the enemies of truth, even for those who harm him, and so that they may be protected and find mercy. And finally, he says, he even prays for the reptiles as a result of the great compassion which is poured out beyond measure after the likeness of God in his heart. This is a reading from St. Isaac of Syria that was translated by Sebastian Brock. And so here, in our church this morning, which will you emulate, the Pharisee or the tax collector? Here is this life, which is a path, which path will you take? The one which leads us into a hard shell, or the one that leads us out into the land of the living? Let's pray. Grant us, O Lord, to trust in you with all our hearts, for, as you always resist the proud who confide in their own strength, so you never forsake those who make, and of course, their boast of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And so, friends, we sing together, Just as I am, thine own to be.
Friends, let's pray our prayers for others this morning. Gracious God, you have richly blessed us, and so often we fall, fail to thank you for these blessings. Instead, we focus on what bothers us, what afflicts us, and we cry out not in faith, but in doubt. Why ask why? And we doubt your goodness, and we become mired in anger, despair, and depression. And so, Lord, forgive us. And help us to have a faith that perseveres. Father, many of us are concerned about the state and the condition of our land in which we live. Help us to pray about these concerns and do the work that we can to bring your truth and your power to bear. Wake up those who sleep and bring peace to those who are anxious. Lord, hear our prayer. And so, Lord, in faith we offer to you the many burdens that weigh upon us and our family and our world. We think of those who are in ill health, those who are in financial need, those, Father, who are concerned at the news that hits our televisions and our radios every day. Those who are grieving. Father, on the heaviness of our hearts, in our homes we think of those nearest and dearest to us at this time. Lord, hear our prayer. And so too, Lord, we pray for those in other lands. The floods. And yet we think of the floods this morning in Kenya. Two parts. One having drought for the fifth year. Simply no rainy season. And yet just a few kilometers away. The lakes expanding. Father... Be with those. Be with those in other lands who experience injustice and oppression. For those whose hunger and, of course, cannot find food. For those who thirst and have no drink. Lord, hear our prayer. We too, O Lord, for our nation and those set in authority over us. And for all the rulers and nations of this world that they may be full of justice and compassion, and that they may prosper and share the blessings that you pour out upon this wonderful world. And so, Father, in our homes this morning, we have come before you, O God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Saviour, our brother and our friend. Amen. And so we, we sing together, friends, our closing hymn, One More Step Along the World I Go.
And so, friends, this morning, may the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love and all whom you meet this day and beyond. Amen.